Hello and welcome back to the final part of the Intermediate series. Today we're going to be talking all about spawn networks. So there is a reason why this video has taken three months to come out, and that's because I've been watching every new update for news about buddy rallies. Buddy rallies really shook up my plans for this video and the beginning of my uh, advanced series of videos because they really changed high level gameplay and how it works out. I have a video on this, um, if you're interested in watching I'll link it here. But the good news is we just got confirmation that buddy rallies are going for all factions except for insurgents in the next update. So essentially when I wrote the script, or rewrote the script for this video, I was operating under the assumption that buddy rallies were in the game, but hopefully they would either be changed or removed. So I was giving a lot of information that is incredibly valuable in the previous versions of the game before buddy rallies, in the hopes that once again that kind of important logistics aspect of the game would once again play a massive role, and games would stop being won by whoever could make the most squads and double click the most effectively. So, essentially, I don't really have time to go through and rewrite everything, so you might hear a bit of weirdly worded stuff. Uh, just know that that was the assumption that was being made when most of this guide was written. Anyway, let's continue. To start, the importance of spawn networks. Beginner SLs tend to look at firefights and squad as actual squads against other squads. Experienced SLs always look at them as spawn points against spawn points. The surest way to win any engagement is to squad wipe an enemy squad off of the objective, rather than to focus on killing enemy soldiers. Having a more diverse, better hidden, or better constructed spawn network is one of the best ways to defend against squad wipes. Prior to buddy rallies, FOBs were considered to be the backbone of any spawn network. Knowing where to construct FOBs is one of the biggest challenges of squad leading, and is possibly the single biggest thing an SL can do to influence the outcome of the match. A single well-placed fob on the midpoint in the early game can easily be a game changer. A poorly placed fob on the midpoint can lose a match before it even has a chance to begin. If I'm squad leading, I feel entirely naked and unable to control the match if I don't have a logi truck with me from game start. If you've still been outsourcing fob building to the other squads because you're unsure of how to do it properly, I'd strongly recommend that you start taking a logi truck every single match after watching this guide. So how do you build effective fobs? To say this topic is controversial would be putting it lightly. Everyone seems to think that they're an expert on it, yet I have yet to find two people sharing the same opinions on every aspect of it. It's honestly pretty hilarious. I've seen posts on Reddit that completely contradict each other on this topic, get equal numbers of upvotes and overwhelming support in the comments just days apart from one another. Sometimes it seems like the person who speaks the most authoritatively is just blindly followed by the majority of people. First of all, when it comes to fobs, there are rarely absolutes. People who say always and never when talking about them are usually incorrect. They are incredibly situational. This ranges from the most pressing and broad topics, such as whether or not it's best to build fobs inside or outside of objectives, down to the most trivial of things. If you place a sandbag outside of a hab, that can be used by somebody spawning as cover, or that can be used by an enemy to camp said hab. Everything has benefits and drawbacks. There are guidelines that I follow though. They may not always be correct, but they'll get you through a vast majority of situations. These are my five golden rules for fob building. Rule number one. Disposability over distractibility. The first important thing to clarify is what the purpose of your FOB is. A FOB should always be built to support objectives. Never consider a FOB to be equal to or more valuable than an objective. This is one of the reasons why defending FOBs is almost never a good idea. I've seen many an objective lost because people prioritize a spawn point over a flag. FOBs are cheap, flags are expensive. There are some situations where a FOB being taken down should be prioritized, but usually it's a result of enemy infantry and their proximity to the objective. For example, if everything is quiet on your defense objective and you notice that your FOB to the west is going down, it's best to push into that contact. If you're able to save the FOB, that's great, but the main reason you should be doing this is simply to meet the offensive before it's on cap range. Even if you do kill the assault and save that FOB, it is now on a timer. This is a phrase that I'll be repeating a lot, and it is more true than a lot of people realize. A found fob is a dead fob. 
eventually the enemy will take it down and you need to be thinking of replacements rather than constantly paying attention to it and attempting to stop them. But Captain, you say, if I can't defend fobs, how do I keep them alive? Well, that brings us to rule number two. Concealment over defensibility. As I said before, a found fob is a dead fob. Habs are incredibly easy to proxy, and radios can be killed in seconds by combat engineers. Once a fob is discovered by the enemy, they will generally shift their focus to it, trying to destroy it or camp it in order to prevent your attack or defense from continuously respawning. The best defense an FOB can have isn't sandbags, HESCO walls, emplacements, or even defenders. It's concealment. A fob placed in a structure, in defilade, in a dense tree line, or in general out of line of sight of the enemy's lanes of attack, can remain there completely undetected by the enemy for long enough to make the difference on an objective. For this reason, you should also be discouraging squad mates and teammates from firing from your hab. Engagements should be started as far away from the hab or any other spawn point as possible. But Captain, you ask, what if this fails? If you're not allowed to defend your fob, what if your concealed fob is discovered? How are you supposed to continue your attack or defense if your only spawn is failing and you're not allowed to go save it? Rule number three, quantity over quality. You should absolutely never, ever only have one spawn. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you only have one spawn, your immediate reaction needs to be doing everything you possibly can to get another one up. An FOB and a rally point is the bare minimum, and if you're on defense, you should be analyzing your position and working on creating more at almost all times. When V12 increased the supply load of trucks, decreased the radio limit radius to 300 meters, and then added the 30 meter overrun mechanic, I jokingly called it the double fob meta patch. Much to my surprise, I didn't really see this technique utilized as much as I thought it would be. Don't forget that building a hab and an ammo crate is incredibly cheap, anywhere from 200 to 600 supply, depending on your faction. If you plan to double fob a defense objective, you have the option of having an immediate spawn directly inside of the objective as well as a fallback spawn if your other one is overrun. You can also use that second fob to get outside of an objective that's being pushed in, if you need to flank around and take down attacker spawn points. If either fob is lost, the impact is less significant. Usually, when I utilize this technique, I keep the radio and the hab together on the objective FOB, and then separate them on the second one in order to get the hab within a reasonable distance of the objective. Double fobbing doesn't always have to follow that exact pattern. On some objectives, I might place both of my fobs on opposite directions of one another to act as canaries or barriers. Some objectives only have one particularly weak flank, where infantry can get into cap range without being seen by unaware blueberries. Sometimes I will deliberately fob those weak spots. The steady stream of people spawning and the status of the hab can act as a canary to give you advanced warning if that flank gets hit. If it does, everyone on your team is going to notice and start pushing that weak flank to counter the enemy. Not because they're experienced and they recognize that the advance needs to be halted before it's at your doorstep, but because they see a fob going down and feel obligated to defend it. This is a taste of how you can observe the mindset of the average squad player and use that knowledge to benefit yourself. That will be a very strong theme of the next video in this series. Bear in mind, it doesn't have to stop there. Triple fobbing is also a possibility. Generally speaking, the more fobs you have in and around the defense objective, the more likely you are to successfully defend it. This is easier than ever with the introduction of helicopters, especially if you have some downtime on defense. I'll go into this more in the next guide when I talk about how to effectively defend, but you should almost always be thinking about how you should be getting more spawns up rather than how you should be setting up your infantry. Of course, that is a bit of a broad statement, and I will be clarifying on it later. Now, the biggest advantage of having several fobs used to be the defensive game against getting squad wiped. It used to be that if your only fob went down, every rally stomped afterwards represented a squad out of the action, forced to go back to main. If some squads weren't wise enough to have a rally at all, they'd be wiped back to main immediately when your defensive fob fell. 
These days, even one surviving rally can allow a team of 40 people to spawn at it within 60 seconds, so the strategy of forcing or preventing squad wipes to capture objectives, which used to be effective enough to allow for experienced 4- or 5-man infantry squads to single-handedly defend or capture objectives, was basically removed from the game. Because of this, these days, double fobbing isn't as important as it used to be, since ultimately a wide net of rallies is the most reliable spawn network. However, I'm hoping that one day squad wiping will be relevant again, so if I were you, I'd hold on to this information. Also, don't forget that not everyone is fluent in buddy rally, and sometimes having multiple spawn points on top of your multiple rallies can also help, so double fobbing still isn't a terrible decision. And of course, as I've said, rally points are the other part of this. Right now, the most effective team structure is to have as many small infantry squads as possible to maximize the number of rallies and increase the size and diversity of your spawn network. Don't forget, in the days of buddy rally abuse, any buddy rally is a potential team-wide spawn. When a spawn point goes down, your ultimate goal should be replacing it in a new location. Having supplies handy on a truck, which I'll get to later, can ease this process along. Running to defend the spawn point being lost is usually not an effective method. Of course, if you're on defense and an external fob goes down, the best move is to push in that direction purely for the purpose of meeting the attack, if nothing else, as I clarified earlier. But if you're on the attack and your fob goes down, think of replacements, not defensibility. Once again, quantity over quality. Rule number four, realism over idealism. It is important to be realistic about how your fob will be utilized. For example, let's say I was considering creating a fob here on Kohat. At first glance, this looks like the top of a hill, which always makes for a terrible fob location, but it isn't. There is a little indent on the top of this mountain where a fob can sit comfortably and be completely concealed from the northern and eastern part of the map, where most of the enemy contact is. The trouble is, if I constructed this fob to have my own squad spawn on it in order to attack a Mazai, I would have the awareness to move southwest into the low ground prior to making my attack. Pushing objectives over hills is a sure way to be entirely useless on Kohat, and the river valleys around Mazai make for good concealment while pushing the objective. All in all, it is not a terrible attack fob for that location, if it's used effectively. But we have to be realistic about these things. Will it be used effectively? No. I am positive that another squad will spawn on it, draw a straight line to the attack objective, and push into a slaughter. They'll be meat grinding tickets, probably giving away the fob location to anyone on the enemy team with half of a brain, and will ultimately cost the team quite a bit. Another example of this is building a fob on offense when there is no spawns on defense. Most squad leaders will take the path of least resistance to get themselves to an objective. If your defensive fob is falling, and you're suspecting that the defense flag will fall after, it can be a poor decision to build a fob on the offense objective, even if you're already on your way there with a logi truck. Many times I've been in this situation, quickly built a fob, and then ran for the attempt at a double neutral. This is a dangerous game though. If I fail and we lose the defense objective, I will relocate immediately because I understand the importance of that. But will the rest of the team? Most likely not. They'll just continue spawning there and lemming their way into a useless objective while our objectives are pushed one after the other and fall. Of course, this point is less applicable now since literally anyone can hijack your current rally point and use it to make bad decisions, but it's probably still worth remembering. One of the surest ways to prevent people from making poor decisions is to force them to spawn directly on defense objective itself. I'll use that to segue into our next rule. Rule number five, proximity versus concealment. The closer your fob is to the objective, the quicker respawning troops will be able to get back into the action. However, the closer your fob is to the objective, the more likely it is to be spotted and attacked by anyone contesting said objective. There's a fine line to walk here, but let's start by looking at an extreme example. Fobs built directly inside of defense objectives. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Defensive fobs that are built outside of objectives usually survive when the objective falls. They can be used to launch a counterattack immediately, contest enemies in cap range, and potentially wrestle the flag back. The downsides are that they can fall if the enemies attack from the direction that the fob is built in while the friendly squads are inside of the objective. 
getting to the objective also isn't as quick as it would be if you could simply spawn there, meaning you'll only be on roughly equal footing with the enemy team in terms of how quickly respawning players can get back into the fight. Furthermore, there's always going to be some portion of players that will loiter around the fob rather than pushing the objectives, especially if the firefight approaches your fob. Remember, idealism versus realism. Fobs that are built inside of objectives are lost when that objective is overrun. Ever since V12, they will be unspawnable the moment two enemies are within 30 meters, even if they're still being kept out of cap range. If your fob is overrun, it's also much more difficult to escape the objective to get a new one down if you find yourself in need of placing more reliable spawns. You can find yourself trapped and unable to create more spawns as your only hab is proxied. However, friendlies can spawn on the objective immediately. This will almost definitely give them a respawn advantage over the attackers from sheer proximity, even if the attackers are spawning relatively close by. Defenders also have no choice but to defend. Poor decisions are much more difficult to make when you're spawning directly on the objective you need to hold. Now if we were really only considering this, I'd probably recommend the external fob, but the idealism and the realism really does come into play here. Ideally, if you constructed an external fob, squads would spawn on it, leave it, drop rallies in or close to the objective, and then hold on as long as possible. Wounded soldiers would wait for revives, or if they were forced to respawn, would have to move roughly the same distance as the attackers. And then, in the event that the enemies made it up to the border, you would have the advantage of the entire defending force not losing the ability to spawn. The fight would continue, even if the defenders were on the back foot, whereas that same fight would have been over entirely if the hab was on the objective. The trouble is, of course, that this is idealism in play. In an ideal world, friendlies would move off of your hab immediately and would be actively trying to fight for the objective. If the hab started to fail, appropriate action might be taken to save it if the cap range is in good shape, but ultimately the team would recognize its expendability and work on alternatives, or rely on rally points that they've set in alternate locations. In a perfect world, nobody would shoot from that hab, revealing its location immediately to the enemy team and allowing potential veteran players on the enemy team that recognize the importance of taking spawn points the potential to go and tear it down. Realistically, it's safe to assume that some portion of the team will always prioritize that fob over the objective if both are taking contact. If the contact gets close, it's reasonable to assume that somebody is going to start lighting them up with no regard for the stealthiness of the hab. Not everyone recognizes how important keeping spawn points hidden is. So, which is better then? Both. Both are better. Don't forget rule number three, quantity over quality. You should almost always be working on double fobbing. Now, on the complete other end of this scale of proximity and concealment are fobs that are built too far away from objectives. You can see this on large maps, where distance can be deceiving. You'll also see this from newer players who think of fobs as some sort of separate entity from objectives. Their idea of a proper fob network might look something like this, where fobs offer access to various objectives and good concealment from players. In a game like Project Reality, where spawns are much more fickle, easy to destroy, and less reliable, this might be a valuable tactic. In a game like Squad, where respawns are that much more quicker, giving up to meet a 10 second respawn wave is meta, and piling bodies on objectives is the best strategy, these types of fobs are almost entirely useless. Sometimes, squads of 9 men will sit on these fobs, provide, quote, overwatch, unquote, build mortars, and support the team by defending a spawn point that they believe to be applicable to most of the map. In reality, they're sitting on a uncompetitive spawn, which technically gives access to several areas on the map, just not in an effective way whatsoever. They will be ineffectively firing at people 600 meters away from them who are actually playing the objective, and they're about to learn the rule of concealment over defensibility when a lone combat engineer decides that they're sick of the mortars, follows the sounds, and then sneaks around the eight oblivious players digging sandbags to destroy 30 minutes worth of helicopter lodgy runs in under a minute. As I've said here, this is a fine line. Close enough to the objective to remain competitive, yet far enough away that your fob is unlikely to be tripped over by enemies unless they are also coming from the exact direction that the fob is located. Let's move on to where you should be building fobs. Not relative to the map or objectives, but the actual structure itself. The radio should be concealed or buried. 
If you are outdoors, put it in a bush or a trench where it can be concealed. If you're indoors, place it on an elevated position that's harder to reach by infantry attacking it, or a room you can block off with a hab or a hisco, or directly inside of the hab where the enemy won't be able to dig it without first completely removing the hab. Don't forget that radios can take damage from HMGs, mortars, etc., which is why you generally want them under a roof. Be careful when placing habs in confined areas. It's the best way to make them stealthy, but it's also quite difficult, and if you mess up and have to dig it up, you're not getting those construction points back. If you're placing a conventional hab, the exits that you have the clearest line of sight on are immediately to your right and left. Freelook can help you judge depth better than if you were just using the default camera angle, and you can also rotate the hab slightly using the arrow keys, which can be effective for seeing one of those entrances to make sure you have at least one exit. Don't forget that they will spawn in the dead center of the hab, so if there's a wall there, they won't be able to get out the exit that you're trying to allow them to. Also, make sure that the HESCO isn't sticking out of the wall anywhere. That will basically lose any of the effectiveness you had from concealing it, and will also allow enemies to dig it from the outside. You'll probably do this by accident a few times before your depth perception is up to par. Don't forget that the actual HESCO extends slightly further than the ghost that you're seeing. So if you're barely allowing enough room in an exit, the HESCO might expand to then close off that exit. Similarly, if you're right up against a wall, the HESCO might expand outside of that wall. So don't take that ghost to be 100% accurate. If you're in a regular, your exits will be a little bit different. I'll place a diagram on the screen to show you exactly how you're placing those. When it comes to actually placing the hab, what I said earlier about weighing the pros and cons of your potential options and understanding that there aren't any absolutes is important. As I've said many times before, the best defense a hab can have is stealth. Placing your hab inside of compounds or in defilade will increase its survivability, but you also have to consider that this fob isn't going to be lasting if people are spawning in and then immediately shooting. If you put the hab somewhere with reasonable cover around, particularly between the hab and the objective it's supporting, you will have a much better chance of not having blueberries fire directly from that hab and instead having them push cover to cover towards the objective. Like I said, because of the fact that spawn wiping doesn't play as big of a role, these days this kind of idealism versus realism is one of the most important aspects of placing a hab. You have to take into consideration that when you place that hab, blueberries are going to be moving in a straight line to the objective. Usually the best habs are placed in such a way that allow the blueberries to do their mindless lemming train in a ideal fashion, down a more covered route towards the objective. You're essentially deciding the way that they're going to be pushing the objective by deciding where they're going to be spawning. Bear in mind that there is a fine line between concealment and entrapment. Placing a hab with very few exits into potential kill boxes can quickly turn it into a meat grinder fob. This is particularly noticeable if your hab is built inside of a defense objective. Now, the important thing to consider is that every person who spawns on a meat grinder fob will acquire a hatred for them. They'll go complain on reddit and demand that people stop building such closed off fobs because they've had an incredibly hard time leaving them or fighting for them. Keep in mind that they are looking at this through the perspective of a single soldier. In reality, a majority of the time, I build closed off fobs for stealth and then accept that if they're discovered, they'll promptly be taken down because they aren't defensible. The advantage of remaining undetected strongly outweighs the consequences of being easy to camp in most situations. As I've said so many times before, a found fob is a dead fob. A defensible fob is incentive for people to defend it, consequently not playing the objective. Having several throwaway fobs is the current squad meta. There are a lot of times that my fobs, after being discovered, become absolute bloodbaths and people are spawning on them screaming, yelling, who the fuck built this? And the answer is, I would build it again in a heartbeat because it provided valuable spawns for a significant amount of time before it was discovered and that was the important part that had the more relevant effect on the objective. I would much rather have a bloodbath on my hand followed by a fob that is promptly taken down than a fob that people are spending way too much time on and actually managing to successfully defend that the enemy is perfectly aware of. Don't forget that insurgents have the ability to place two habs per fob. Use this to get a wider spawn network at a cheaper cost. Now one thing that'll help you the absolute most when you're placing fobs is just your simple map awareness that you have from your experience playing the game. 
I can't go through every map in this guide, that would bloat it to an unacceptable length. So instead, I want to take an example of one particularly difficult objective to fob, Gabu K. This point essentially consists of a small town completely surrounded by steep hills with a road through the center. Your main options are either to build inside of the town, build on the surrounding hills, or build on the plains past the surrounding hills. None of these are ideal. To start, all of the planes past the hills are far enough away that your fob is starting to become uncompetitive, and I'm generally not considering those. So what about fobs inside the town? Fobs set up here are destined to become meat grinder fobs if you're pushed off of the surrounding hills or your team doesn't recognize the importance of being on them in the first place. The moment that starts happening, every enemy on the map is going to be camping up, laying prone, and spawn camping you as hard as they possibly can. If your hab is outside of a structure, the exits are going to be visible from multiple angles, making it incredibly hard to leave. Returning fire is also nearly impossible, as the enemy knows exactly where you're going to peek from, and there's going to be a pile up of people trying to spawn and desperately get out, people blocking the exits using the structure as cover to return fire, and eventually smokes are going to start being thrown, blinding your team and allowing the enemy to storm into the cap range completely uncontested. Your hab will also be entirely vulnerable to mortar fire and be visible from just about every hill. If your hab is inside of a building, namely this green four-story here, which is the most common, you're going to be having at most two exits. Nobody is going to be leaving that building as long as people have their sights trained on them. The advantage is that you're not being shot immediately after leaving the hab. Here, you can move to any window in the entire building and return fire, making it much more difficult to camp it with impunity, even if it's in turn more difficult for friendlies to leave the building and remedy the situation as a whole. So what about fobs outside of the city? They come with a whole new set of problems. If you construct it on the peak of either hill, you're completely throwing away the stealth advantage of your fob. It's going to be an immediate target. It's also going to be incredibly visible to the enemy from many different points on the map. In a lot of ways, this is similar to building in the open, inside of an objective. The way it differs is that people are going to be able to fight more effectively from this position. That's honestly a curse, though, because if people take fire immediately after leaving the hab, they're going to turtle up and return fire. If their position is favorable, they will sit there regardless of what's happening in cap range below. These hilltop halves are a massive problem on maps like Kohat, where people utilize them as fire bases with good sightlines over the objectives and refuse to push. It's another case of idealism versus realism. Ideally, some amount of people would be up on that hab, covering the objective and engaging enemies far outside cap range. If the people inside the cap range started to fail, they would be pulling off and moving in. Realistically, the entire team is going to spawn up there and feel no incentive to protect the cap. This is especially noticeable on this objective in particular. It's very common for me to see two fobs built on opposite hills at the very beginning of the game, with infantry posted up on both shooting at each other. The reality of the situation is that the flag is going to be captured by the team that best recognizes that what they're doing is useless and makes a mad dash for the town. Once they get behind that first row of buildings, they are next to immune to the far hill and actually in cap range, unlike the other team. Building an FOB on that hill is putting a lot of trust in your team to be able to recognize that, and I find that it hurts me more often than it helps. As I said, there are a few options for hab placements outside of the hills surrounding the flags, even if they are a far walk, and they can actually be more effective here than they are in most situations. The only trouble is that of course people still have to push over the hills in order to get into the objective, and they will feel the same temptations that they would if they were spawning on the hills. Even if they don't actively decide that they're going to lay prone and shoot into the objective, they're easy to see up there and oftentimes they're forced into it when they prioritize their life over the cap zone and go prone after taking shots. The other issues with these habs is that they're normally extremely exposed to the expansive road network around Balea, which increases the chance that they'll be taken down by flanking squads or spotted by armor rolling around. In most maps, a squad that flanks from a similar angle to where you've constructed a fob stands a decent chance of missing it entirely if it's well concealed. On Gabuke, if your fob is beyond the crest of the northeast hill, literally any attack coming from the entire eastern hemisphere of the objective will see it and prioritize it. So what's the best option? I'm still trying to figure that out myself. I wanted to use a really difficult example to explain how fob placement isn't black and white. There is no always, and there is no never. 
In a majority of situations, I will prioritize making a meat grinder fob in the greenhouse inside of the objective. Even if people are constantly spawning on it, dying, removing our defender's KD advantage, bitching about it later on Reddit, and screaming that fobs should never be built inside of buildings, at the very least, everyone who's spawning is forced to protect cap range. Furthermore, the hab will never become a meat grinder if your defenders are following their natural compulsion to spread out to the surrounding hills and create a healthy net of infantry just outside of cap range. This fob only really starts to suffer when you're on the back foot, unlike the other fob option which can immediately show its downsides if your team isn't experienced. Sometimes, anyway. Other times I run into squad leaders who will spawn on the fob, start building things, and insist that their entire squad remains inside the building for whatever reason. Of course, that never ends well. Hey, squad two. Yes. Yo, join me, dude. Okay. Join Look, me. Listen. I'm gonna... Oh shit. That's why I'm I not joining you. However, I think that it's generally easier to build the fob inside and encourage people to spread out than it is to build the fob outside and encourage people to move in. But if you're paying attention, like I've said so many times before, this is just the fob I'm prioritizing. You should always be building both. That is the correct answer. Double fob this objective, triple fob this objective, get a wide buddy rally network. The more, the merrier. So now that you know where to build fobs, let's focus on what you should be building. As I mentioned in previous guides, most fobs that you place shouldn't consist of anything more than a hab and an ammo crate. Every piece of cover that you place increases the likelihood of the fob being spotted in return for only a marginal increase in protection, if that. Not to mention the time spent digging that piece of cover is time not actively spent spotting for enemies, reacting to firefights, or pushing towards the objective if you're outside of one. Similarly, building weapon emplacements drastically increases the chance of your fob being spotted. HMGs are loud, distinct, and fire a hell of a lot of tracers. Mortars are even louder and more distinct, and once again, they're usually only marginally increasing your team's effectiveness at the cost of advertising your fob's location for the enemy. I'll talk more about mortars later. The exception to this rule is the ATGM. They are incredibly useful. They're just as loud and distinct as the other weapon emplacements, but they can be used as an extremely useful offensive or defensive weapon against armor. Most people place ATGMs at locations where they have the best field of view. This makes them incredibly noticeable and easy to snipe people off of, but given that the average range of an engagement between an ATGM and a vehicle is pretty great, someone with good situational awareness on an ATGM can usually get the drop on any vehicle, as long as there isn't infantry engaging him. When I'm building ATGMs, I try to keep them fairly distant from the HAB and the radio, and I do try to give them the best sight lines possible despite the obvious disadvantages of easily being spotted. Now, ATGMs cost 600 build points. Conveniently, the cost of a hab and an ammo crate for conventional factions is also 600 build points. Because of this, I almost always carry multiples of 600 build in my logi trucks. If I'm playing a very tight, infantry-focused map and I'm building an important fob that I know a majority of my team will be spawning in, I'll probably just take 600 build and then focus on getting a ton of ammo down on that fob. If I'm playing on a medium to large map, I will look at the first objective I intend to fob up. If I want to place an ATGM, I will bring 1800 build. 1200 for my first fob, plus the ATGM, and then 600 on standby. If I don't need to build an ATGM, I'll bring 1200, once again keeping 600 on standby for that next objective. If I'm going to the midpoint and would also like to double fob it, then I'll bring 1800 build. The 600 that I'm keeping on standby in all of these scenarios is either for building a new fob if mine goes down, or building an FOB at the next destination if a flag is captured. In extreme cases, I might take 2400 build for a total of 4 HABs or ATGMs, bearing in mind that this leaves me very little ammo. There is of course potential for the ammo to be brought later by helicopter, or another Lodgy run. Please note that this only applies for conventional factions. For a regular militia, 200 build is enough to construct a hab and an ammo crate. For insurgents, I strongly recommend taking 400 per fob for 2 abs and 2 ammo crates. You can choose to use this law of 600s if you'd like, or to create one of your own. Whatever you do, make sure that you keep the supply that you're saving for later inside of your logi. You do not want another squad leader spawning on your fob and building emplacements with it. It really sucks when you're keeping 600 for your next fob and then some SL place down razor wire and ruins your whole plan. 
It's also very handy to keep 100 ammo in the truck, as it will allow anyone in your squad to switch to a crewman on it and repair it if it was disabled by the enemy. Regardless of what supply you're bringing for your current fob, I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend having enough on the truck for a next fob afterwards. Don't forget my last guide, where I talked in great depth about the incredible importance of mobility. You want to be ready to ditch your objective and get to a new one with a new fob at a moment's notice if you want to be winning games. Also, it very much helps if your current spawn gets taken down to have the supply on the truck handy for a new one. Another note, if you're choosing to double fob and want to place one of your fobs inside the objective, you're technically free to place as many emplacements as you'd like. Stealth is irrelevant here. Now, many people argue that this is the one valid application for super fobs, especially on invasion. I still argue that they are rarely as practical as people like to imagine they are, but if you're smart about it and you're placing mostly emplacements and less cover, they can give your team a slight edge. There are a few very important points to remember though. People building emplacements have next to no situational awareness. If you have a majority of your squad digging rather than keeping an eye out, you are very likely going to lose that objective to the first smart squad that attacks you. I have walked my squad directly into super fobs under construction before, taking down 20 minutes of work in 120 seconds countless times. All because nobody was actually utilizing the defenses to set up a perimeter, they were too busy playing Minecraft. It is imperative that you keep a small number of people building, with significantly more watching your back. In the background, I should be playing footage of the countless times that we've just walked directly into super fobs and massacred blind people. Also, don't forget that if your team doesn't feel the incentive to push past the emplacements that you've constructed, which is very often the case, you're most likely hindering the defense of the flag. A healthy defense and squad covers a bit of ground outside of the objective. You don't want to incentivize people to cluster up. Also, do not forget that every single piece of cover you place could potentially be used against you if you're pushed in. Build your cover accordingly. And last of all, don't forget that emplacements are not cost effective. What I mean by this is that 3,000 build supply can translate into 5 functional fobs with ammo crates, which is enough spawn points to cover almost every objective on the map. That is infinitely more useful to a team than 7 HESCO walls, which costs about the same. Of course, this doesn't really apply if you have a steady logistics stream coming in and you have an abundance of build supply, but if you don't have a truck running and you're limited on supply, save it for the next objective or as a contingency plan for your fob failing. Now if I haven't deterred you already and you're still going to super fob, at the very least build a repair station and keep it stocked with a good amount of build supply. Your team's armor will love you for that. Another note I'll make is that, honestly, sometimes it's better just to leave supply and ammo unspent on a fob so that it can be used as a checkpoint for logistics in the future. You'll see this fairly often on Yeho or Talil, at least on the servers where I regularly play on, where you have dedicated Logi squads building a sort of second main base with a checkpoint for build supply and ammo towards the center of the map that other squads can then use to have a reduced Logi run time with their individual Logi trucks. And last of all, if your fob is inside an objective and you don't mind broadcasting its position, consider building mortars. Fortunately, mortars cost 300 apiece for conventional factions, so building two mortars costs you guessed it, 600 supply, which fits in really well with my law of 600s with what I take from main. Mortars are an interesting tool in squad, but you have to understand what they can and cannot accomplish. They were recently buffed back into being at least somewhat relevant at engaging infantry, but what they have always been great at is destroying structures. If you have perfect intel on an enemy hab, you can destroy it without ever setting foot near it if you have a competent person with mortar tubes and some spare ammo. Also, if enemies are confined within a single compound, such as on said hab, you can demolish them with the current buffed mortars. Those mortars may be almost useless for firing at people who are just in a tree line or a hilltop, but once you get that much condensed infantry in place, they can actually be pretty brutal. If you are building mortars though, be aware of the ammo cost and be constantly supplying them, preferably with helicopter logi runs if you are able. Mortars can actually be a great way to contribute to the team's success if you're stuck sitting on defense while there's no contact. Now, because this is the part of my guide where I have chosen to talk about mortars, I do want to say a couple of things about dedicated mortar squads. In V16, I think of mortars as situational weapons. If a hab is located in the open, or if there's a particularly dense cluster of infantry that's unable to move, 
construct a mortar and deal with it. Now, in V12 and previous versions, I was under the opinion that mortar squads just weren't worthwhile. They were better used as a reactionary tool to an exposed hab being spotted than an actual dedicated small squad running them all match. When V13 came out though, and they kinda rebuffed explosives, they're back to being at least somewhat effective against infantry, so a small three-man mortar squad can be reasonably effective. But please notice how I said three people. The incredibly important thing to say about mortar squads and specialized squads in general is that you do not need nine men. You will never ever be effective enough to justify a nine-man mortar squad. If the entire team is playing infantry, that's close to 25% of the team's infantry, but in the current version of the game, where there is much, much more people being dragged away into vehicles, you will take nearly half of the team's infantry for indirect fire. It is just not worth it. If you want to operate two mortar tubes with a lodgy driver and a spotter, that's four men. Don't fall into the trap of thinking, how many men do I need to operate my mortar safely and effectively? Think more along the lines of, given how effective I could possibly be, how many men can I justify taking from the objectives? It's very easy for people to start dreaming about a two-man mortar team being supplied by a two-man logistics team with two forward observers and three men working on security for the mortar fob, but I promise that you will never ever be effective enough to justify taking that much manpower away from the front line. Sorry if I'm coming across harsh, but this is definitely a sore spot for me. I have seen countless games ruined by nine-man mortar squads, tank squads, helicopter squads, or generally just any other specialized squad that isn't always on the objectives, taking way more people than they need to accomplish their task. I'd like to quickly mention something that I forgot here in post, and that is that helicopters can actually play a very significant role in a mortar squad. For example, if you're running four men, which is the most I would recommend. You can actually set up two different fobs and have four tubes running if you're being supplied by the helicopter and that's handling the logistics ends of things. And that won't take too much infantry away from the front lines and will provide twice the firepower you'd normally be providing. Another interesting note is that helicopters are fairly strong right now in terms of how much damage they can take, and it's not too sketchy for them to fly around spotting. It's not necessarily something I personally like to do or really recommend, but it is possible currently. And a helicopter working with mortar tubes by supplying them and then scouting out where the mortars are landing can actually be a really cool bit of teamwork that works quite effectively in squad. If you're interested in mortars, this can be some food for thought. Now, moving on to a new topic here, I want to give my view on Lodgy Runs. This is going to be controversial, as I have an opinion that differs quite a bit from most experienced members of the community. Most experienced SLs believe that Logi trucks should always be kept on the move, always delivering supplies to the front line, and never stagnant on a fob waiting to get abandoned if they're left and it's overrun. These are all valid points, but I don't do this myself for one big reason. Ever since Logi trucks were given enough space to fit your full squad, they inherited the role of the transport truck as well. Many community members, myself included, were against this change initially, as we knew that Logi trucks would stop being used for logistics and start being used as transports by inexperienced SLs. Funnily enough, I've pulled a 180 on this line of thinking and have used Logi trucks as standby transports for quite some time now, even when they're entirely empty. The reason for this is how effective they are at lightning fast mobility. If you recall my last video, one of the biggest reasons I was against taking APCs as your main vehicle was that APCs are often busy and are unreliable means of transportation, given that they'll regularly be returning to base or far from your squad or caught up in an engagement. Having a Logi truck doing runs is really no different. I am never, ever willing to be in a situation in squad where a flag capture is taking place and I am not already on the road reacting to it. Since buddy rallies killed a lot of my flag capturing and defending techniques and really reduced how effective I can be, reacting to the turning point of the game is now my single strongest influence on determining the outcome of the match, possibly tied with the fob I create early game on the midpoint. I'm never going to find myself in a situation where I am not able to fully utilize this approach and possibly win a game. Of course, the consequences of this can't be ignored. My playstyle can negatively affect my squad's effectiveness in a small way. 
Dying and resupplying is usually common enough that a couple of magazines and patches will keep players competitive, but it's not uncommon for my squad to be out of GLs, medics to only be working with a handful of patches, and the AT being forced to be stingy with rockets. Because I have a clan, I do have the ability to coordinate with them effectively, and ammo is always prioritized for AT without myself even needing to ask. Rifleman ammo bags are essentially treated as spare rockets in BHM, which helps offset the consequences of this playstyle. Helicopters are another good means for ammo resupply that I utilize as often as I can. They're a fast supply of ammo to a lightly contested fob and can help negate the effects of not having constant logi runs from my vehicle. I'm not saying that I never do logi runs, by the way. When I'm low on ammo and I know I have some time, I will try to coordinate them. It's just not as reliable as doing them constantly and involves more discipline for those on the objective. Now, ammo is a fairly minor thing, assuming that you're keeping your AT supplied. The bigger issue with my technique here is the greater possibility of losing trucks when fobs are overrun. My only justification is that I weigh the benefits to be greater than the risks here. Getting trucks stuck behind enemy lines can really hinder a team, but I can also win a game if I have a truck on standby. I won't pretend that this is the perfect doctrine, and I won't pretend that there haven't been matches where I have been responsible for trucks being lost behind enemy lines and that having a pretty serious effect on the team, but there are extreme benefits to this risk as well. There are many situations where I can react even quicker than I normally would have been able to and can make it to objectives after a turning point long before the enemy team, setting in motion a leapfrog maneuver that easily wins matches. Now of course you can bypass this with a second vehicle. You can take a transport truck in addition to your lodge, just like the good old V9 days. Uh, the reasons why I normally don't is because normally there's only one transport per map now and it's set on a delay spawn, meaning it's unavailable from start. And of course there's also the fact that when you take a second truck, you're removing an oh shit rally vehicle, as I like to call them, from main. If a squad gets wiped and needs to react quickly, you might be hindering them. Anyway, thank you for watching. That concludes the entire Intermediate series. We're going to be moving on to the advanced stuff next, which is largely going to focus on attacking and defending flags. I currently don't have any of the scripts written out for that, so I'm not sure the format it's going to follow or how many videos there will be, but I'm probably not going to start working on them until the next patch is out and I have confirmed that buddy rallies are gone. So it might be a while before the next one comes out. Anyway, thank you for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.